And I'm Christopher Schreck. Welcome back to the Abundant Scene Podcast. Today we're joined by Giancarlo Valle, a New York-based designer whose hybrid practice merges architecture, interiors, furniture, and more. Giancarlo was raised between San Francisco, Chicago, Caracas, and Guatemala City. He earned a master's in architecture from Princeton University and worked for firms like Shop and Snoheta before founding his own studio in 2016, where his use of refined forms, earth tones, and raw materiality has attracted an elite roster of clients and collaborators. In this episode, we speak with Giancarlo about balancing openness and intention, the drawbacks of specialization, and why uncertainty is key to impactful design. Thank you for listening. I gotta say, it's nice to have someone in the studio. It's like a different energy. It's cool. We're, we actually work on the same floor. Sean Carlo, have you been there since you established the studio? It was a it was a slow move, a slow progression to to Canal Street. Um, we started on Broadway and Walker in an old like pre war office building, and then kind of got pushed out of that for rent reasons, and then started looking. Did your team change when you moved? Yeah, there was always like a shift a team shift, and then a physical space shift. But we've always been really involved in the renovation. I mean, when we moved here first, the entire floor was all drop ceiling, no skylights, everything was covered. And then we saw a little bit of light coming through one of the one of the ceiling tiles. And we saw all this staining and we're like, oh, there's, there's light underneath here. And then we we're like, okay, we got to do this. But that was 2018. You're the reason I'm here. Because you were like, Landon, there's a space. You should get it. Well, originally I wanted the space, <laughs> but then I couldn't do it all. And I was like, okay, the next best thing is <laughs> one of my favorite artists. <laughs> you can always have a desk over here. You, you can use my desk. You can put a computer right here. We've been talking about like, how, how do we unify the sixth floor? Like conceptually. Yeah. You know, I we feel could like tear some be, walls down. We yeah. could share this, like the space back here, make a little living room with a bed. I need a place to sleep in my studio for sure. And now there's another space available. Are you going to take it? I think I'm going to take it. Okay. Cool. Cool. <laughs> so, it's the slow takeover, but it's a, it's a great building. We made merch for the building. 264 Canal Street yeah. merch. Yeah. Sold out. <laughs> it's so far. So far it's unavailable. So. <laughs> Weightless only. Yeah. So how many people are working at the studio at this point? We are 12. Are they all like full-time? Everyone's full-time. We've really just been been growing, I, w- I would say organically, because it's, you know, we've, we've never felt like we've needed to do anything that didn't feel right. It's just been slow and gradual. But the, the energy, I think, post-COVID has been incredible. It's like built, really building back the culture of the office and the studio, which I think that's just where the magic happens. We're in every day, and there's just a lot of energy that, that I feed off of. What does your day-to-day look like? It's so unpredictable. I mean, I think that's why I love what I do. And it's also been this gradual shift out of architecture and, and, and my background and my experience working professionally, which was very, I would say, you know, maybe more by the book, if you could say that. I mean, it was just very traditional architecture schooling after that, working for a couple of great architects in the city and the flow. I mean, architecture is, is incredibly predictable. It's very slow. It's 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 very plan based. So you have to be organized to do it. And there's a unpredictable nature to the interior side of what we do that I think counteracts the architecture. You're putting out fires. You know, it's you're you're solving problems, but like very directly and having to improvise in a way that I don't think you can actually improvise with architecture. So 
there's a sort of jazz element to interiors and furniture, which I think I feed off of. And you then can, it sort of filters back into the architecture. You can just show up and be more intuitive and respond to a site, a conversation and a feeling. Yeah, I think it's a feeling. Yeah. I think that's that's hard to do with, with the architectural work that we do. But I think you need both. When you're working on, on an architectural project, do you ever get to a point where you're like, I really thought this thing was going to work, but in person, the feeling is off or wrong and can you can you make adjustments on the fly like that it's a good question i think you have to um but you also just have to be in tune with it regularly be open to to change you know you 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 draw the best and you plan for the best version of it and then you know that maybe x y and z might change and and you have to be okay with the inevitability of that Design is interesting because it's a conversation between decisions that are made and then decisions that are made for you. There are things that, that pre-exist the project and sort of determine certain things. And then you make decisions about what you want to do. Right. And it's when those two come together, brings you to a point that you couldn't have. I, I would think that being ours is about like having like a personal sense of taste and yeah. making a bunch of decisions. You just have to make decisions all the time, but none of the decisions are made for you. You're facing the abyss every day. Whereas I feel like having some of that uh, decision-making process just kind of like folded into yeah. the workflow, it actually sounds very nice. <laughs> but there's some security in it where it's like, I can only go so far before there's some mm -hmm. natural pushback, which sounds, Great, actually. It's inevitable. You you have, you know, budgets, timelines, mm -hmm. client demands, you know, site conditions. A lot of those just take you down a path. And then it's how you decide to go this way or that way yeah. against each one of those that sort of puts you, you know, it's it's a constraint and you have to you have to be comfortable in that sort of unknown, right? That you don't necessarily know everything when you come into it, but you have to trust in that process. Yeah, we had Minjay on the show for the first season, and we were talking with him about the, the myth of autocracy and how he had to kind of set aside these notions of the individual designer as auteur and kind of recognize how all of these outside contributors were actually collaborators, you know, whether it was his, his team or his clients or other artisans. And I guess I could pose a similar question to you in terms of how you then gain a sense of ownership over the results or what that sense of ownership looks like for you. It seems like there might be a little bit of ambiguity there. Yeah, I mean, we work with a lot of clients that have strong personal taste, yet at the same time, they're coming to me and the studio for a perspective, right? And I think the stronger the client, the better the project in a way. Like, I think if we were given our blanche and they're like, okay, create the perfect version of what you want to do, I wouldn't know how to start. I just love that there's embedded energy in the client that we have to like play off of or, or sort of solve. To me, that's, it's just the way it's the training. It's, it's everything that is, is probably a lead up to where I am now that makes the process happen. That's the formula for us. But people are also coming to you because you have a unique, distinct sense of poetry. They may have opinions and their own sense of taste. And sure. maybe those are really strong, but yeah. still they could go to someone else who would listen to everything that they say, maybe, mm -hmm. or have less of an opinion. So I think what people come to you for is this like very unique uh, sort of artistry that you bring to the table. Yeah, the poetry, the poetry is one thing, but you also have to be, you know, open to to change. I mean, I'm constantly in this evolutionary process of of refining what I like to do. And I would say that probably the DNA of the office is that we're constantly working off of existing ideas and just tweaking them, you know, but it's just this, it's, it's like a Darwinian thing, but it's, it just keeps evolving. And we're like, okay, take, take this, this, and this evolve it into this project. What could it be? Does it make sense? Scrap it, go again. And then, and you just keep sort of massaging and tweaking. You're writing a wave. Yeah. And it's, it's undefinable. It's undefinable, but it's there. Like it's really, it, it's actually in the space. We, we make a lot of models and, and miniatures of our projects. And that is very intentional because we want to see the idea, even if it's incomplete, it has to be there. And then you just pick up that idea. So they're like, it's like a graveyard of ideas right now, like in, in the studio. And you just pick up an idea and you're like, okay, how could this 
get combined with that and turn into this. Do you just intuitively walk around the studio while you're thinking and talking about a project and like grab something that yeah. feels just feels good? And yeah. Like, okay, I like this thing right now. How would this translate to this project? Yeah, there's a way of thinking about it, which is that, you know, the ideas of, of design and are, are really, they don't belong to a single person, but they belong to the field of design. And it's up to you what you do with those ideas. So it's, it's a bit more removed. And I think it, it also takes the sort of, I mean, I would say the personality out of it a little bit, which I kind of like, but it makes the decision making process a little different. And you say these ideas, they don't belong to like me or you. They're they're part of this larger arc of design, this historical, you know, trajectory. And it's it's how you use it. I mean, a lot a lot of things have been designed already and they're very well designed. And it's like how do you how do you build on the shoulders of of an idea to bring it forward? And I, I think that's how you connect things to history. And that's how you bring yourself forward. Also, design is so intrinsically tethered to the human experience, right? The scale of our body, yeah. the comforts of our body. There's a gigantic list of prerequisites for how we experience clothing or cars or or spaces, or homes or whatever, other pieces of architecture, libraries or doctor's office. And so there's all these ways in which we... We navigate those spaces physically, but also emotionally and intuitively. How we feel when we're in these places, what kind of, you know, what the lighting is like, what the colors are mm -hmm. like. We have a kind of a cultural general understanding before we step into these spaces of how we should move and what that should feel like and look like. There's a whole sort of inherited list of prerequisites for how we how we engage with design. And you know that. Intuitively, you you know that. You know, mm -hmm. like you don't have to think like a chair should defy gravity for the human body and it should be relatively similar in scale to a person. Right. You, you don't even have to think that. You just you just know that intuitively. Right. So there's lots of things uh, in our society, in our culture, um, in design that you know and everyone sort of intuitively knows. So I think half of that sort of decision making has been made mm -hmm. for you. And so you just kind of tap into other other modes of expression within that history. Yeah, and it, it's been an evolution for me moving from architectural training into design because architecture in the last like 10 years has been on this, this sort of track towards like being more and more marginalized in terms of how it's executed. So the teams are getting more complex, projects are more complex, and the, the last domain of architecture has been the exterior. Like this is like the, the one thing that architects are sort of holding on to because now there's space planners and now right. there's engineers and, and there's all these consultants that can, you know, lighting that can take over, you know, what used to be the field of, of, of an architect is now, you know, being subdivided into all these different specializations. So the, the last specialization had been or has been the, the facade and exterior, the face of the building. And so that was like when I was in my training that was at the top that was the conversation it was all about how to reinvent the facade and face of the building which is mm -hmm. a very like postmodern idea right but it, it was kind of the, the, the sacred space that architects could still own it's also free to the public to perceive exactly uh, it's democratic in the sense that anyone can see it from a distance especially in a skyline so yeah. it has this it's it's a gigantic advertisement whereas interiors of many of these spaces may be more there may be a hierarchy to how you can engage with them mm -hmm. and it's harder to access and so it, you can't really choose which places uh internally people can you know experience and how and why but on a facade it's free and it's, it's available free. to the public exactly it's free and you know that that was sort of the mission right you, you know you were designing for the skyline and for, for the city in many ways and so it just left the interiors totally unexplored for me. And that's, that's been the move to, to really identify like how people live, what it is, and just understand feeling more so than style. You know, how do you, how do you capture feeling in an interior that you can't do with, with an exterior in the same way? I mean, they just, it just trigger different, different emotions. Moving through your spaces, like being at your home in Connecticut, there's this like theatricality to how you, move through the dining room to a hallway to a living room through a stairway or 
uh, a corridor or whatever, like use color and you use these sort of kind of dramatic visual statements, I think, to really have like hard lines between different mm-hmm. environments. And it feels it feels very dramatic uh, and it feels very experiential. And it, it, there's like a, um, uh, it's like watching a film or something. It's, it's quite beautiful. Yeah, the personal projects, I think I've learned, I've just learned the most from. I feel like I always have to have a project to be able to, to work on other projects because I can make a million mistakes on my home and be okay with it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure that we get the appropriate version of it into, into our clients' homes. <laughs> Actually, I experienced that being at your house and I wanted to ask you that now, which is like, what is the relationship between the studio and your home? I feel like at home, you have people working on the projects you know, materially uh, while yeah. you're there on the weekends or whatever. Yes. Uh, and so it's like, you're always still kind of in that headspace. Yeah. Even when you're relaxing for the weekend, you're still, you're living in your workspace, really. Yes. It's, that, that is like probably the ultimate showroom or uh, example of your of your work. It's also the most private, but there's, there's something about it where it still feels like you are kind of tinkering when you're there yeah. and never really seems like you can turn it off. It's true. Yeah, you, you have to be able to to be responsive to it. And I, I think that's why I, I really enjoy this process of, of just evolution. And also since having kids and seeing how they interact with spaces and, and where they tend to go and not go has been really eye-opening for me and like unpredictable. Right. You know, and that, I feel like that part of it just keeps me on my toes too. It's just, uh, there's just a naive quality to what they're, they're attracted to or not attracted to that keeps me like trying to ask the same questions, you know, and just be like un- untrain myself a little bit from, from what, you know, you just inherit over time. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned you know, your kids a moment ago. That's kind of an interesting side part to this is that since establishing your studio, you've also started a family with your wife, Jane, and something landed and I talk about is the challenge of, of sustaining a dedicated creative practice while also dedicating oneself to romantic and, and domestic commitments, uh, especially when children are, are involved. It'd be interesting to hear how you've kind of gone about finding the balance for yourself. I think it's actually brought a lot of order to my life because time is so efficient and precious that, you know, my time management has gotten exponentially better. I mean, it's still full of challenges, daily challenges, but there is a comfort knowing that there's a priority set, like the family is, that is it, you know, but how do you integrate your creative output into that? And they pick up on it. I think they're intrigued by it and, and want to know more about what their dad and mom do. Yeah. They want to um, see you guys, in, guys thriving as well too. Yeah. It's a very positive thing. And Jane and I work on these homes together. She's an editor is coming from a very different mindset and has a great way of seeing through all the noise that I tend to produce and, and pluck out the things that just have staying power. Yeah, I mean, being creative on a schedule, it forces you to be more dialed in on one level. But it's it's interesting, too, because it means you can't spend as much time deliberating or second guessing or, or worrying about this and that. You kind of have to trust. You can become more instinctual and have to trust the vocabulary and the skills and the knowledge that you've built over time. You, you do. And, and you also have to be accepting of the decision, right? Like, I, I think you have to know that that decision, if it's, you know, if it has to be made at a certain time has, there's something in that, that you have to be comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, that that's the part that I think just takes time. I think it's like uh, about understanding that any singular gesture doesn't define you wholly. It's just a it's, it's a reflection of where you're at at a period of time, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be an attempt at, at pointing in the right direction on any given day. And it just moves you somewhere, and, mm-hmm. and you can respond to wherever you're at. You know, like I always say, you can't use clay you don't have yet. You have to be in a position and then respond to it and deal with it and make decisions. And then that will lead to other situations where you have to do the same. But that that process, it's riddled with failure and, and that's how you learn and grow. It's, it doesn't have to be this like, if I don't get this right, I'm not a great artist. I'm not a great poet. I'm not a great X, Y, Z. It's, it's, this is a reflection of where I was at on any given day. It just kind of reduces the power in that sense overall in your life. And you can just make micro decisions all the time. 
Speaking of, of family and, and creativity, I also wanted to ask you about uh, Palo Roma. If I'm correct, so the idea is basically you, you and Jane founded a, a skincare brand dedicated specifically to, to children. Yes. Yeah, it's like with all these things, they come out of an urgent need to find something that you don't think exists. And that's how, how it started. I mean, she, Jane was pregnant with our second child, our, our daughter, and we were just looking for something that was clean, that would be a staple, and that also had an elevated sense about it that was consistent with the other things that we buy and 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 like to put in our home and so it just came out of that that search it really wasn't anything that sort of checked all those boxes and the idea to combine the, the names of our children into this brand we kind of kicked it off and we said it has to be this and and so it's really it's a core set of products essentials really that are just part of your daily routine and are really like built into the, the sort of like relationship that you have with your kids, you know, with your, your bathing and then the process of moisture. Like it's all part of this routine that we really enjoy and try to be part of on a daily basis with our children. Um, but it's also a brand that I think can grow with the child. Um, so it's not just a baby brand, but it's, a, it's for children. And actually I use it every day as well. Did I read somewhere that you had family members when you were growing up in the skincare business? Yes, my my family is is in the skincare business, and yeah, have been supporters of this project and helping us, you know, in in a very small way to get get it off the ground. And we obviously we've been talking about how you've deliberately built kind of a, a multi hyphenate practice where you're moving between different fields, different methods, but always you know pointedly framing the work within a single studio, a single vision. And we alluded a little while back about how that approach might have come, at least in part, as a response to your experiences in architectural schools and at different firms. But I wonder, as you were making that transition, were there other practitioners or studios that you looked to as reference or, or even as inspiration? I think historically, there's been a group of people that I've looked at always, Frank Lloyd Wright, Gio Ponti, people that just were looking at design without scale. I felt like that was an art that, and a, and a practice that had existed, you know, historically. And my experience of it in New York was that it, it was very siloed. You'd have, you know, the architecture, the interiors, the decoration, and there were really, there were different camps. And we felt like in Europe, you still see many practices that work across them all. I wasn't seeing that, and that wasn't my experience in in New York and the United States. I think that's changed. I think that that tendency has has grown. But when I was first starting it, it felt like I was looking to Europe a lot to understand how those practices had grown and evolved. But, you know, I would say, you know, what Pierre Ivanovich has been able to do, Joseph Durand, that, that are, you know, practicing now and, and doing it at, at an incredibly high level. But there's also like Studio Paragale that do architecture and, and do it in a beautiful and quiet way where you know a Paragale project, but you also don't know how they do the project. <laughs> There's just so much mystery around how they work and how they are able to really touch like all elements of it. Do you think that's a reflection of historically how art was situated within European cultures and societies versus the US? Hmm. I think people uh, have a more intimate relationship to art and poetry, I would say, historically in Western Europe than they would in the U.S. is maybe more like labor motivated. Whereas I feel maybe there is a, a, a paradigm shift happening in the States now where there's a greater acclimation to uh, experiencing art in new ways. And it's kind of changing the expectations around what it means to live with objects that resemble art. I think that's true. I would say even, yeah, New York being like, yeah. there's there's a tremendous amount of output right now in this area and, and, and you know, other areas as well in, in the U.S. But, um, like, you know, my experience has, has been the one here. It does feel like it's 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 changed. And 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 then you look at someone like, you know, then my mind goes to, to Frank Lloyd Wright. And, you know, you think about how that practice developed over time and how it felt like it was a kind of outlier in in that moment but now is seen in a way that that makes total sense like it's just it's you're getting reacquainted with with the idea that, that you can move through these spaces and and these projects seamlessly 
I grew up really close to Natalia and West in Scottsdale, and I used to go all the time with my dad. And there's something really, I was really intimate and very vulnerable to be in a space where all of the objects and the placement of the objects has been articulated by the architect as well, where it feels like the vessel that contains the life uh, isn't where the story ends, that the, it continues and it continues and it continues. It's like a Russian doll sort of experience where walking up, seeing the landscape, seeing the, the chosen plot of land and seeing the materials and how they were placed from that natural landscape. So as you approach the building itself, the landscape and the environment and the ambiance and the aura of, of the place itself is clearly a part of the work. And then you see the structure itself. And then you see the poetry and the language of the structure and how the materials are used. And then you you cross that barrier, that threshold into the interior, a more intimate space, and you see the relationship of the structure to the chairs and, mm-hmm. and the placement of the chairs. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the way you move through the space is now actually being emphasized by the placement of the objects and the materials of the objects. And so it's like... Uh, maybe there's a bit more of a macro experience with like a facade of an architectural piece. Mm-hmm. And there's a more micro experience as you move in and that sort of, not just a visual language, but a sensibility and a way of being is also translated to the, the interior. And it's, again, it's not even just like the the materials uh, and the scale of the objects, but the placement and, and, and how that kind of relates to, you know, choreography, like how we move through these places and what it means to sort of navigate through an interior intimate space and our own sense of awareness of our bodies and our comfort levels and how we get to sit down and relax and have a conversation or whatever. It feels very intimate, like you're really tethered and connected to the psyche of the person who made this work. You're not being kept at arm's length, you know, uh, you really feel like this person is like meeting you more than halfway actually Mm -hmm. so the experience um is like kind of holistic i would say it's interesting that you grew up near near telius and i grew up near all the chicago projects and so my my relationship to to frank lloyd right was was that it was it was the studio it was these very i would say you know they were small spaces very hermetic and then just earlier this year i went to the Hollyhock House in LA, which blew my mind. Yeah, I was just there about a month ago. Really? Yeah. Obviously, he's been somebody that I think about a lot, but to go see that house in the looseness of that house, like it, they were just, and it's also like, I mean, there's a history with Schindler, uh, apparently going out there to oversee that house. And and it, so there were a, a set of ideas and a, a simplification and like a more reductive version of Frank Lloyd Wright, which I really hadn't experienced in person that was just incredibly refreshing and just brought me into sharper focus like what it is he was doing and, and you know also just how he evolved right i mean there's there's just so many different influences that were at play and and to see that house and walk through that and and then you know come back to new york and and go through the guggenheim again and, and you know just i feel like i'm just rethinking his work you know having studied it and you know, had it back in my mind for, for so many years, but to kind of see things just again. And to experience them. Yeah, to experience them after having been doing what, what I've been doing for a while. It's, it's reassuring. There's a there's just a newfound appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of, of Kevin Kelly? No. He's a really interesting guy. He was a founding editor of Wired Magazine. He published the whole Earth Review. So he's kind of interested in alternative technology, digital utopianism, he's a conservationist, etc. But um, when I was doing research for this, I, I came across this quote of his that made me kind of think of you. And, and basically he says, a standalone object, no matter how well designed, has only a limited potential for new weirdness. And the idea is basically that an object situated in a network or within a space intentionally can take on countless new meanings and associations that never would have come about on its own. Right. So design at a certain point ultimately becomes a medium of of conversation as much as one off composition. And I wonder how you relate to this idea of interrelation, both as a designer, but also maybe as a collector. No, it's really interesting. I I think so much of the way I, I look at something is is context driven. I'm looking at we're looking at a, at a piece of design of historical design. I'm thinking about the arc of that. You know, I'm thinking about where where it may have come from did, did it grow out of 
you know, a set of ideas which were maybe on the fringe of that particular period of time that, you know, I latched onto because it was somehow marginalized and kind of bringing that to the center. So I'm, I'm looking also at, at periods and trajectories that, that had a little bit of that outsider mentality, you know, where you're, you're trying to understand why, why something went this way, but it doesn't fit into the arc of this particular, you know, designer and, and connect that to, you know, what's happening today. But I think it's also the way I look at design a little bit through an, an outsider's lens. I think you just have to wear that, that hat sometimes to, to kind of break free of your own decision trees, <laughs> you know, and, and you're sort of in this process of un- unlearning to get to a place that you couldn't have otherwise. There's an objective freshness, I think, to, to seeing things with new eyes as often as possible. Yeah. Which is really hard to untangle your yeah. own mind and un- undo that. Yeah, it's 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 removing yourself from the process a little bit. So it's just being okay with bad decisions and and okay decisions and great decisions. You know, just just treating them a little bit more from from afar and and trusting the process and bringing your instinct into sharper sharper focus. What is your relationship to taste? Because I think a lot of what you're saying about these sort of marginalized sort of tracks within these aesthetic languages over time and sort of refocusing them towards the center. To me, that seems like maybe things were perceived as like outsider for political reasons, or maybe they were perceived as like kitschy or of like poor taste or of less than perfect taste. Mm-hmm. It's probably the internet has a lot to do with it, I'm sure, like yeah. flattening of information, the way information is disseminated and how those hierarchies have been broken down a lot. But also just like, I think, recasting what it means to have good taste or what taste even is, or if bad taste even can exist in 2023. I wonder, I mean, I think about the possibility of bad taste existing, period, anymore, all the time. I, I'm, I'm conflicted as to whether I think it's even something that exists. I, I think it's it's just a matter of like who you are and where you are in the conversations that you're having and how to reframe that. But yeah, what is your relationship to taste? Do you believe in good taste? Do you think you have good taste? I think that's where you have to go really far in into yourself and, and, and trust that, you know. But, but I also think you, you have to be able to edit. People used to say that like Mies, Mies van der Rohe was great at building buildings or designing buildings because he ignored many aspects of the building. <laughs> you know, like he really didn't consider, didn't have to consider every element. You know, he focused on the ones that he thought were essential. And I think there's just that level of instinct, which is, you know, comes with an entire career of building and seeing what you can do to get to that point where you know that you don't have to solve every problem. Well, yeah, I mean, on a human level, you cannot. And if one believes that they can, it, it's not a very nice person to be around. There's no humility in that. I don't really think you can solve any problems. You can just do your best, your personal yeah. best and see what happens and be open to, like you say, change and growth over time. I wanted to ask you one last thing, yeah. though, too, which was about your upbringing and how you got to New York and, and your family and, and the culture that brought you here. Yeah, it was also very slow evolution but the beginning was was always i would say through art school i went to art school knowing i I was probably going to transfer into architecture because having an aunt who's a sculptor and who i had admired since i was very very young told me i could not go into the art world that would have made me want to do it so much more (laughs) so this is this is the most roundabout way of of getting back into it but but still from afar because I think what we do is is horribly different than art. Why? I need to know your answer to that question. I think it's what we were talking about earlier, where I need the feedback. You know, I need the constraint. And that constraint has to come from outside of me. Right. I think that's fundamentally, like, that's one of the fundamental differences is that, you know, you're creating the constraints. I'm relying on others. There's a control in your system. I don't mean like a like you have personal control, yeah. but there's like a control network in your system. Whereas as an artist, you just face the abyss. And you have to create that, right? You have to create the, the constraint and the rule. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to relinquish rules in my life right now yeah. uh, and just trust my intuition and uh, be comfortable just like flying free and having fun and making work that feels reflective of wherever I'm at. So uh, I'm trying to let go of as much as possible in my practice. I think that's kind of my 
my path as a person, as a human, and as an artist is learning to just do that as much as possible, to just fully let go. And I think that the synthesis as an artist, uh, as a working artist, is like when you make something and someone likes it and like wants to talk to you about it or whatever, you know, wants to show it. There's a conversation. There's something that feels like responsibility. There's something that feels more like a control, you know, something more like what you're saying. But when I'm in the studio, I think my responsibility is to let that go mm-hmm. and to make work from a very sort of genuine, authentic, and whole and real place. And I think that to me comes from tapping into something that is like the, the opposite of rules and systems. It's, it's completely free, pure freedom. Yeah. Which I think can actually be quite terrifying for most people. I think most humans are so comfortable and familiar with um, a grid being laid over their their experience and and their lives that to kind of peek under that or remove that or turn around entirely, um, I think can be quite a terrifying proposition, which is why really great art can be so transcendent because even if you can't get there yourself, you can see something fundamentally true in, in some artworks uh, that's a reminder of that place and beautiful to feel that again, I think, for a lot of people. And I, I think some people feel it when their children are born or when they're overcome by beauty and nature or maybe when their own death is approaching. They feel that there's like a dislodge in the, in the sort of grid of their reality and they just like feel free fall for a second. And it's beautiful to feel it. And I I think everyone deep down feels connected to it when they feel that, but it can also be terrifying to actively pursue it on a day-to-day basis because it's completely at odds with what society tells you is important. But yeah. (laughs) I am interested in the crossover between art and other fields, though. I, I think that there's more than we've formally been taught. I think that a lot of the beauty and poetry that comes through in anything comes from similar places within humanity. And so while I may be more dedicated to it on a time scale very differently than you, I I do think you access something very similarly also probably quite often. When I hear you talk about like working on a project and walking through your studio and pulling out, you know, old miniatures from your design grave or whatever, to me, that what I'm what I'm picking up on, what I'm what I'm intuiting, and, and the way I translate that is that you have moments where you're just pure. It's just pure expression, where you're just like you feel something and you trust a feeling and you take a leap of faith and you make a decision and then you let that decision be a form of truth within your practice. And it's not true. It's not real. It doesn't matter. It's it's you just have to trust it, you know? And, and to me, that is, that is a form of facing of the unknown, uh, which is very, very much in line with what I think it means to be an artist. And I do think that formally, traditionally, historically, that those lines have been drawn much firmer than I think they needed to be. And part of the whole reason why I'm interested in having these conversations is to, you know, play whatever role in, in attempting to recast that in some way. You know, it's really beautiful to hear you speak about these things. But for your aunt to say that, for you to go to art school anyway. (laughs) It's true. You know, that's, it put you on a path, but there was always this idea, right? Like, yeah, I knew I had to come at it from a different angle. Architecture and the training or whatever you want to call that experience got me to where I am, you know? And it's partly, you know, like the resistance of all the things that I've been probably working against in sort of my training and building a practice that, you know, it's not built against that, but it's, you know, in relationship to is probably getting at some of these ideas that you're mentioning now. It's like there's there's something else there that I'm looking for. There isn't one path towards it, but you're circling, you know, you're getting closer and closer and closer, you know, and it gets easier. Time is great in that way. <laughs> The Abundant Scene Podcast is produced by Ryan Leahy. Our theme music is by Casper Bjork. You can read and listen to all of our conversations at AbundanceZine.com. Follow us on Instagram at AbundanceZine, and be sure to like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>